Food is a cornerstone of our families, our communities, and our country. And it's something that's on all of our minds right now. But with all of the uncertainty in the world, Canadian food is one thing we can be certain about. Thanks to you. All of you. From those who produce, to those who process, to those who get it on our plate. Canadians never shy away from a challenge. We always answer the call. Every Canadian has a role to play, and ours remains unchanged, providing safe, healthy food to Canada and the world. Food has always mattered to Canadians, but never has it mattered more. And even in times where the distance feels greater, food still brings us together. Thank you for your service. Good afternoon and welcome everybody to the 2022 FCC Ag Economic Outlook. Welcome to those of you that are with us live today on January 25th. And for those of you that are watching the recording, we hope that you enjoy this event. I am Darlene McBain and I work on the industry relations team here at FCC and I'm happy to be your, ho your host for today. I'm coming to you from my home office in Montreal, Quebec. And I do want to acknowledge that Montreal is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mohawk and Algonquin peoples. And it is a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Wherever we find ourselves today in Canada, we are on traditional indigenous territories with rich traditions, stories and histories that should be understood and honored. And it is our commitment in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration to honor these people as vital contributors to our society and respect the diversity and strength of all Indigenous people across the country. Now, before we get started, I do want to ensure that everybody is set up to participate in a comfortable, comfortable way for this event. If you experience any technical issues throughout the event, there is a blue support button at the bottom of your screen. So if you need some, to contact someone, someone will be able to resolve your issue. This session will be recorded and a link sent out to everyone who is registered. So if you must get away or want to share with your network, it will be available in a few days. So in the next 75 minutes or so, our FCC economic economics team will join us to review 2021. And more importantly, they will provide us with a forecast of what's in store for the upcoming year and some of the key economic drivers that we should be watching for in 2022. We'll then shift from looking at the trends and risks in the operating environment to identify what you can control within your farm business by covering a few best farm management tips with one of our farm business advisors here at FCC. 2021 was a challenging year. The pandemic had quite a few domino effects. We can think of the su supply chain disruptions that contributed to the emergence of inflation. Over the year, the overall inflation rate in Canada has risen and now stands at 4.8% above the, Canada, the Bank of Canada's target rate. And then there was the major drought in 2021 that caused the tightening of supplies and of many commodities grown on the Canadian prairies. That's just a couple of challenges, but there were also some positives throughout the year uh, for the agri-food supply chain. We can think of the demand for the commodities that grew and the food, and the, pardon me, we can think of the demand for the commodities we grow and the fo food that we produce that remain very robust at home and abroad. Commodity prices for crops and livestock remained elevated and higher than their five-year average in many sectors. And farm cash receipts in 2021 are estimated to have grown 10% relative to 2020. And the forecast from our team of economists, whom we'll be hearing from in just a few moments, is that there is a possibility that farm cash receipts could grow by another 4.6% in 2022. So speaking of forward-looking look projections, let's hear now from our economic team to discuss the economic trends 
that we should be monitoring in 2022. Let me start by introducing JP Gervais, FCC's Chief Economist. I'd like to turn to you, JP, to discuss what I would call some of the macro factors in the economy. I just highlighted inflation as a key disruptor in 2021. And I'll put you on the spot right away and ask you, do you think that inflation, JP, will persist in 2022? Well, thanks, Darlene. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, well, I think, well, thanks for the question. And, and to answer your question directly, I'd say, yes, I do think that we're going to have to live with inflation above the Bank of Canada target. Uh, and it's fair to say that most economists, certainly myself, I will put myself in that category as well, we underestimated the persistence of inflation. Uh, there are a number of different reasons for, for the inflation figures that we have currently. Um, supply chain disruptions going all the way to transportation, uh, labor shortages as well. If you look at job vacancies right now across a lot of different sectors in the agri-food supply chain, we have job vacancies that in some cases are about a third higher than they were prior to the pandemic. And so with more job vacancies, obviously the expectation that wages are going to go up. Um, I, I mentioned transportation. You know, we, we have some, some positive signals as well. You know, if uh, you look at the Baltic Dry Index, for example, a, a major index of global shipping, it's down from the, the peaks and, and way down from the peaks that it reached in, in the fall of 2021, but it remains way elevated as well. So some good signals. And so for that reason, I do think that inflation, uh, once we sort out some of the disruptions we have in the supply chains, I do think that inflation is going to subside, certainly in the second half of 2022. But that is consistent nonetheless with prices remaining elevated, right? So we're talking about inflation coming down. It doesn't mean that prices are gonna fall. It just means that we're going to live with high prices, but perhaps prices that somewhat reach a plateau when it comes to overall inflation in the economy. And we'll have a chance as well to be more specific when we talk about farm inputs later on in the, in the show. The one thing with, with inflation I'd like to point out is that um, I often say it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense you know inflation becomes a problem when expectations are that we're going to get some inflation right so if you have you think of businesses and consumers for example if if businesses expect that their costs are going to keep going up not only when they try to pass on some of the additional costs that they currently face they'll try as well to anticipate and if they do anticipate higher costs they'll try to pass on a higher cost increase than they currently have and that feeds into the supply chain and then workers are trying to get higher wages and so forth, right? So in a sense, inflation becomes a problem when we have expectations of future inflation. And I think that's the role of the Bank of Canada to say, hey, you know, we have to be careful here that uh, those inflation expectations are not entrenched in the economy. And so uh, that's going to be an interesting few months now that uh, in 2022 for, for the patterns of inflation. But overall, I would say, lower inflation, but prices remaining elevated for most of 2022. Great. Now, JP, there's lots of connections to make between inflation and agriculture. But I believe that one of the things on the mind of most of the people attending this event here today must be interest rates. So how do you see inflation being connected to interest rates in 2022? Absolutely, for sure. I would say this is another one topic. I, in all the communications I have with either customers, industry stakeholders, I think interest rates is the number one topic when it comes to inflation. So first thing to note, tomorrow, so we're recording this on Tuesday, January 25th. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the 26th, we are going to get a Bank of Canada decision when it comes to their policy interest rate. Right? And they will publish as well tomorrow on Wednesday their monetary policy report. And that's a big, on, and, and they do that on a quarterly basis. And this is usually, uh, at this time, usually a, a, a pretty significant um, publication in a sense that they are going to release a lot of what they are thinking about when it comes to inflation signals, the pace of the economic recovery, and so forth. So if you go back, and, and so if you think of tomorrow's, for example, tomorrow's decision with the Bank of Canada, if you look at what financial markets believed or anticipated when it comes to the probability of seeing the Bank of Canada lift its key policy rate tomorrow. About a week ago, that probability was around 45%. So let's just say it was a coin toss. So basically, you know, just a coin toss in terms of whether the bank is going to lift its policy rate tomorrow. 
Now, fast forward to where we are today, that probability, what financial markets are signaling, signaling is that this probability actually went up. So there's a strong chance that tomorrow, indeed, we see a rate increase by the Bank of Canada. And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I do think by March, early March is the next decision at the Bank of Canada. So if it doesn't happen tomorrow, we're going to get uh, strong language that interest rates will be increasing later this year. And perhaps as early as March or at the latest, and I was going to say for sure, I mean, there's not no assurances in, in, a, in a pandemic context that we have right now, but um, by April, we should get a rate increase. And please note as well that it doesn't have to be just 25 basis point increase, right? It could be as much as 50 basis point, 0.5% increase as well. There's nothing that says that the rate increase by the Bank of Canada has to be by 25 basis point. Uh, if you look at in 2022, the expectation of financial markets is that a Bank of Canada overnight rate, their policy rate is gonna go up by 125 basis points. So between now and the end of 2022, an increase of 125 basis points. So that's 1.25%. So if we think of the so what, now we'll put up on the screen and shortly a, a chart that looks at what we call the yield curve. And this yield curve looks at interest rates, in this case, uh, bond yields from Government of Canada or yields from the Government of Canada bonds. Uh, and looks at short-term on the left-hand side, short-term yields and long-term yields on the right-hand side. And the idea here is that if these interest rates in financial markets, if interest rates in financial markets are going up, price of capital is going up, and at the end of the day, borrowers, businesses, individuals that borrow money are going to be faced with higher interest rates. And, and what this basically says is look at the yield curve recently, January 21st in this case, and then compare that to what it was four months ago. And if you look at the one-year bond rate, uh, you actually realize that it went up by around 75 basis point. So it is interesting to note that without any type of Bank of Canada action, interest rates in the marketplace for a one-year bond have gone up by around 75 basis points, right? And I think the point here is that it's not just about what the Bank of Canada does, it's also about what the markets expect in terms of movements for interest rates. And so I think that's the number one thing to monitor. So you see that the one-year rate has gone up. Uh, if you look at the, on the long end of the curve, if you look at a five-year bond, for example, it also went up. Currently, long-term rates are just slightly above what they were prior to the pandemic. So I think that's the question really right now for businesses and pharma operations is, should I be looking at my own strategy when it comes to you know, the financial risk that I face, right? Should I be locking in some rates? Should I look at my loan portfolio and say, well, maybe there's an opportunity for me to lock in some rates, knowing that we're likely to get short-term rates going up in the next 12 months. And the idea is that you know, as the Bank of Canada start lifting interest rates, this yield curve, the orange line that you see is gonna shift, right? The markets are potentially shift. The markets are gonna say, all right, so then now we went with a one rate increase What's the impact on the economy? Is it slowing down inflation? Is what are the prospects for growth in Canada and so forth, right? And once the market realizes is this enough, is this not enough, those type of things, then that's when we're going to see interest rates move again. So I do think there's an opportunity given where long-term interest rates are, I do think there's an opportunity for farm operations to consider um, where they're at when it comes to their financial risk, uh, Darlene. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of things to consider um, as regards to interest rates. So. Let's talk about currency. I remember, um, JP, from a previous conversation that um, there are two things that mattered most for the value of the Canadian dollar, interest rates and oil price. So if you put everything together, what is your forecast for the loonie, for the value of the loonie against the US dollar? Yeah, well, you're right. I mean, the, the patterns in interest rates matters a great deal. Um, and the pace of increase in interest rates between what we're going to see in Canada versus the United States matters for the exchange rate between the loonie and the US dollar, right? So if rates are going up faster in Canada, the demand for, for Canadian dollar is going to go up and that will raise the value of our loonie. And the opposite is true as well. So if the if interest rates in the US go up, um, then the, dollar, the demand for US dollars is going to go up uh, and that will raise the value of the US dollar against the loonie, right? So um, at this time, it is really hard and difficult to 
really be really clear about one way or the other, right? So the pace of increase in interest rates in both countries is, is likely to be quite similar at the end of the day. Now, US is, the US is facing a lot more inflation than we are currently at, you know, in the neighborhood of 7% in the United States. But I do think that, uh, and again, this week, we're going to get more information for the US Federal Reserve. But I do think that, you know, when we're done with 2022, the pace of increase in interest rates will be quite similar between Canada and US. So that leaves us with the oil price driving a lot of the future value of the, of the loony. And in that case, we're, what we're seeing right now is that the markets is sort of brushing off concerns around demand for oil in the global market, right? So we've seen oil prices move up in recent weeks, almost, you know, really since the start of December of last year, 2021. Um, uh, of course, you know, in the last few days, we've seen oil prices retreat a little bit, but the, the concerns around future demand for oil um, with the current wave of the pandemic and so forth doesn't seem to be really big. And so uh, prices have moved up, especially considering that there are, I'm not going to say concerns, but certainly doubts or, or, or question marks around the ability of oil producing countries to expand and meet their production targets, if you think of oil exporting countries, or even the United States, its ability to ramp up production is under, um, there's, there's a bit of concern there or a question mark around the ability of the US to ramp up production. So because of that, we're seeing oil prices climb. And if you put all of that together, as you said, we're, we're coming up with a forecast of the US dollar, sorry, a forecast of the loony at 81 US cents above between 81 and 82 or on average for 2022. And that's above what we had as an average value in 2021. Now, I know a lot of farm operations as well are interested in the value of the Euro. Um, sometimes it might be that we're looking at equipment from Europe and so forth. Uh, our forecast for the Euro is also that um, actually a decline in the value of the Euro against the Canadian dollars. So we're forecasting that the exchange rate will be 0.69 Euro um for the canadian dollar and that's an increase in the value of the canadian dollar relative to last year um there are lots of different um there's lots of uncertainty right now with respect to that forecast if you think of the russia slash ukraine conflict and perhaps retaliation from russia in terms of sanctions that they could see uh imposed on on their country and perhaps the retaliation of limiting the supply of natural gas available to Europe, which would actually trigger a lot of inflation in Europe and perhaps bringing the, the, the currency or the euro down. And so all of these things need to be considered and monitored throughout 2022. But overall, we see a Canadian dollar that is uh, gaining value in 2022, darling. Great. That's great context. Thanks, JP. Um, we're going to shift gears now and dive into a few of the ag sectors and expectations that we, we may see with regards to profitability for uh, 2022. And speaking of the Canadian dollar, one of the sectors for which profitability is impacted by fluctuations in currencies and is the grain, oil, seed, and pulse sectors. And to speak to this, we have Craig Klemmer, Principal Economist with FCC. Thanks for joining us, Craig. Thank you. So Craig, we heard a lot about logistical problems and crop and pulse exporters having difficulties accessing containers in 2021. It was more profitable for the shipping companies to return containers to Asia empty. So how do you see global supply, supply chains evolving in 2022? Yeah, um, you know, the story around global shipping this year was extremely important and quite interesting. You know, inter internationally, we saw a combination of strong demand for consumer goods, um, you know, savings rates were higher and we saw more demand in North America just for goods moving across the ocean there. Um, you know, on top of that, we saw increased demand for commodity movements and, and strong demand for uh, commodities from North America to Asia and around the world. Uh, and, and building on that, we saw a reduction in global shipping capacity, whether it was ships, uh, containers that were available for moving these products. Uh, and this all resulted in quite a few service delays and significantly higher shipping costs. Um, you know, JP highlighted uh, the Baltic Dry Index and, and how it increased. Um, it's still about three times higher than it was pre-pandemic levels. So, uh, you know, we still have elevated shipping costs, but the good news is they are, they have decli declined quite significantly from the peak. Uh, domestically, we've also had, you know, a number of disruptions and the BC floods would be uh, right at the top of that. You know, floods cause major damages to railways, 
and other infrastructures um, that you know reduce our access to that Vancouver ports, which are just so important for the grain and oil seed sector. You know, grain movement to West Coast continues to be impacted. Um, you know, with Western grain oil seed production down 40% uh, from what it was in 2021. This overall impact might not be as great as it would have been under a normal uh, production year or average production, but nonetheless, it, it is impacting prices and it is impacting the ability to move grain out of the West Coast. You know, if we're looking forward and, and what does this mean? Um, I expect that we'll continue to see this, uh, you know, slow improvements to global supply chains. Um, you know, we continue to see that through those lower shipping costs as JP highlighted. Uh, and, and we'll just see, you know, the, the overall system uh, recovering slowly as we get more capacities built on into play and, and those uh, supply chains uh, just free up some space there. Domestically, it's gonna take quite a bit of time for us to rebuild this infrastructure. Um, in BC, um, you know, you look at railroads and, and uh, highways to be rebuilt. Uh, so that's going to take some time and, and that's going to continue to cause delays or disruptions through much of 2022. So I expect that shipping costs are going to remain elevated due to just this capacity constraint, uh, but we should see some of that easing slowly through 2022. Great, might uh, require a little bit of patience moving forward for a little while yet anyhow. So. Um, I'd like to highlight the strong demand for commodities. Uh, over 50% of our Canadian grains, oil seeds, and pulses are exported every year to global markets. And Canada's faced significant trade challenges over the past few years. We can think of pulses uh, going to India and canola to China, for example. What are you seeing for Canadian export opportunities um, for 2022, Craig? Yeah. Well, demand for Canadian grains, oil seeds, and pulses have been extremely strong um, over the past year. You know, if we just kind of look at export volumes, they're 11% higher for the 2020-2021 crop year uh, as compared to 2019-2020 crop year. Um, strong export demand has also supported these higher prices for Canadian producers. If we just kind of look at the aggregate, oil seed prices were nearly 30% higher in 2021 compared to 2020, and grain prices were 20% higher uh, compared to a year ago. So, you know, that's some of the positive stories when we look at it. Global production of corn, soybeans, and wheat, they're expected to increase in 2022. You know, these high prices are going to help fix its own problem. Um, this will increase global supplies and cause producer prices to decline somewhat. Um, with the global economy recovering and demand for vegetable oil is increasing for both fo uh, food and fuel, that's going to continue to support uh, opportunities for, for Canadian producers um, uh, for those export markets. Um, so, you know, the combination of the strong demand, higher prices uh, has contributed to significantly stronger farm revenue. You know, if we look at where we are right now, we're forecasting that um, overall cash receipts will be roughly 20% higher than 2020 and reach close to uh, $29 billion in 2021. So, you know, this is largely driven by these high prices strong producer deliveries through the first half of the year and, and good production that we move forward. Um, obviously, we're going to see some softening in producer deliveries in 2022 and see some declines overall as we move forward. But this is largely a, a product of that lower, um, lower supply of product to move. Uh, domestically, Canadian canola crushers and livestock producers don't have sufficient supply to meet some of these current demands. So when we think about canola exports, um, you know, we're expecting those to be about half of the levels that we, uh, we have roughly half of last year's levels and domestic use will, you know, decline nearly 20%. Uh, we have sh uh, shortages of feed, uh, primarily barley for cattle and hogs in Western Canada. And this is leading to, you know, strong imports of corn into Western Canada to help backfill that. Um, so, you know, we look at this story overall and, and, you know, it's kind of a bit of a mixed bag. You know, you've talked about market access as well. And, you know, when we, you know, moving forward, I don't think we'll see a lot of change in that, uh, that uh, portfolio right now. Um, and really is, you know, if we think about the reduction in domestic supply, the urgency in trying to access these markets and, and all the things that are happening right now, this just isn't likely going to be a huge priority uh, in the short term and, and don't see a lot of movement uh, on, on those uh, market access constraints uh, in 2022. Okay, now... Let's talk weather. So weather was one of the top stories for Canadian agriculture in 2021. And as we mentioned earlier, there was drought and an extreme heat wave that impacted Western Canada. In Eastern Canada, on the other hand, conditions improved and were generally favorable for crop production. 
Uh, are we seeing any improvements in the current drought situation in Western Canada? And are there any weather related stories that you think, Craig, that, uh, you know, we should be monitoring that could impact producers in 2022? Yeah, I mean, the overall, that the drought situation is something that we're going to have to monitor. Um, you know, we have a figure here that looks at um, the Canadian drought situation as of December 31st. Um, and you can kind of, if you look at the, the picture here, um, you can see, uh, well, you can see that if we look at the overall drought situation in Canada, um, we continue to see a bit of a mixed story there. Uh, in Eastern Canada, Atlantic Canada, moisture conditions remain quite favorable. Uh, in Western Canada, we continue to see some improvements overall, but there's large portions of the Prairie Provinces that are in extreme drought. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the picture that popped up here, you can see uh, by that, that dark red there, the amount of areas that still are in this uh, extreme drought. So I think the big story that we're going to have to be monitoring, and especially in Western Canada, is do we see a slow melt uh, and timely spring rains here uh, in terms of helping to regenerate uh, moisture conditions and to help kickstart pasture conditions as we uh, move into to the new crop year. Um, if we do see that, you know, I think there's opportunities that we have average uh, crops and, and we see, you know, good crop production. If, if this uh, drought continues on and we don't see significant improvements, uh, it could, could impact uh, how, how people approach, uh, how farmers approach the new year, uh, new crop year coming up here. Okay, so um, while, while stock to use ratios are forecasted to soften in 2022, Craig, they'll, have, they'll remain supportive of prices. And I continue to hear that fertilizer prices are three times higher uh, than last year. How do you expect this to impact producer profitability and seeding intentions for farmers in 2022? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this has been a big story for this year, Darlene. Um, you know, if we look at the availability and cost of crop inputs, uh, they're going to be a major concern for producers moving, you know, for this year. Uh, if, we if we currently look at forecasts of, of prices of fertilizer, they're 75% higher in 2022 compared to where they were in 2021 on a calendar year. And, you know, we often think about things in crop year. Um, if we look at from the crop year basis, they're actually 200% higher than they were on a crop year basis. So, you know, obviously crop input prices are, are quite a bit higher and, and that's why it's, a, a so, it's so important for producers right now and, and you're hearing so much conversation around that. In addition to that, herbicide prices are roughly 8% higher and there's quite a, quite a big uh, diversity in terms of those higher uh, herbicide prices uh, depending on which, which products you're talking about. Um, we've seen sharp increases in glyphosate, for example, um, just because of availability and some supply chain disruptions there as well. So these higher input prices are definitely going to reduce profitability for the sector. You know, we got a, a couple charts here. And, you know, if we look at, um, you know, compare fertilizer, fertilizer prices uh, relative to crop prices, and um, you kind of get this expectation of how, how profitability is going to move. Um, we got uh, compare, you know, uh, the price of uh, canola relative to the price of uh, nitrogen fertilizer here. And what you clearly see is that, you know, the price of nitrogen is increasing, but canola prices have been able to keep up with that. And we look at kind of how it compares versus its longer term average. Uh, canola prices and plantings are still uh, would be supportive of that, where profitability is going to be pressured as compared to last year but still remain historically strong. You know, you flip the story in terms of Eastern Canada and, and the, the ratio of corn versus uh, nitrogen prices. And you see that corn prices just haven't been able to keep up to um, the, the increased cost of fertilizer in the same way, uh, partly because of the, the large crop in the United States and, and that's helped keep uh, corn prices down somewhat. Um, but at the end of the day, what you do see is that that affordability and you know that proxy of profitability has been deteriorating on corn, and that could re result in a shifting into the uh, shifting of acres, excuse me, um, from corn into soybeans uh, in eastern Canada, where rot rotations allow for it, and, and there's that opportunity there. So you know this tightening of producer profitability is also expected to result in some producers reducing application rates of fertilizer potentially. Um, you know, we'd see probably this happen a little bit more in Western Canada where I'm sure there's a number of farmers considering 
Uh, you know, what is the carryover of fertilizer from last year? Is there opportunities to re reduce seeding rates and try and bring that uh, input cost down a little bit? And that's going to impact demand a little, you know, slightly in terms of the fertilizer situation as people are looking for those opportunities to just improve that profitability. Um, I think it's also going to be really interesting to monitor potential shift in seeding intentions for the next year. So, you know, we've got a, a table here that we can look at. And if we can, you know, kind of compare that profitability or current seeding uh, or prices of, of commodities here, future prices of commodities relative to uh, historical and, and those spreads, or we can start understanding where we'd see um, overall acres uh, adjusting to here. So in Eastern Canada, we're predicting a, a 3% increase in soybean acres as producers shift away from corn and just kind of that higher input cost, uh, you know, impacting that profitability, as well as those strong prices that we're seeing for oil seeds overall and, and helping to support part of that shift. Um, but there's going to be a limit in which we can see those acres shift overall. You know, we think about the eastern market, um, you know, there's so much strong demand for feed uh, in eastern Canada with the li large livestock herds around uh, for, you know, hogs and dairy, et cetera. Uh, and that's going to limit that, that shift that can occur. In Western Canada, we're forecasting to see canola acres increase. Uh, you know, we're thinking pretty close to 5% overall, um, while pea acres are expected to increase about 3% and just seeing those higher prices and strong demand for those commodities uh, allowing and seeing that shift happen there. Uh, we, aim all, we may also see some small, small increases in, in derm and wheat acres, uh, sorry, wheat acres at the expense of lower um, uh, returns for say lentil, barley, oat acres uh, into this new year. But we're just starting to see uh, planting intentions happen and there's gonna be some movement and shifts in, in commodity prices as we, we, as we approach that seeding date. So something to monitor, but obviously we're seeing that shift towards soybean and, and canola acres on, on that strong oil seed demand in the market right now. Great. Well, thank you, Craig. So uh, it, it sure seems like high grain, oil seed, and pulse prices uh, are a silver lining to crop farms, especially considering the drought in the prairies in 2021 and other weather phenomena elsewhere in Canada. But to livestock producers, uh, this is quite uh, the opposite. And, and it seems like, uh, you know, the feeding costs climb, which challenges profitability on, on farm operations. So to discuss how high feed costs are affecting uh, the hog sector and what else we should be monitoring in this sector, I'm going to turn it over to Sebastian Puglia, Principal Economist with SCC. Hello, Sebastian. Uh, I think you're on mute, Sebastian. Not sure. Can't yeah, hear you. I was on mute. Yeah. Okay, hello. great. Hello. So I'm curious to understand, um, to what extent are the high feed costs currently impacting the profits in hog operations across the country? Yeah, uh, feed costs are becoming a larger share of the total cost for hog producers. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's impacting profitability. If we take as an example, a farrow to finish facility, uh, we estimate that feed costs accounted for about 54% of total costs in 2020. Uh, that share rose about 59% in 2021, but in 2022, we estimate that it would be about 20, uh, 58%. Uh, looking at costs on the tells have the story, of course. Uh, hog prices in 2021 were on average much higher than in 2020. Uh, they declined from January to June and then started declining afterward following uh, the usual seasonal pattern. They're currently higher than at the beginning of 2021, and we expect the prices in 2022 to compare to those in 2021. Uh, now, if we look at, uh, at the picture, we should have a picture here on the screen shortly. Uh, what we have on this picture is the hog to corn price ratio. So we take the price of hog, fed hog, lean hog, and divide it by uh, the price of corn uh, for both Ontario, Quebec, and Manitoba. Uh, we're using corn for in Manitoba. We could have used barley, but the, the graph would have, have a, a, very, a very similar shape. So what we see in 2020, we had a lot, a lot of ups and downs. Um, that's because of the pandemic, the effect of the pandemic. But 2021 was more of a typical pattern where we have higher hog prices in the summer. So we have that this ratio goes up in the summer and then declines afterward. Uh, so... 
This ratio actually signals better prof uh, is a signal of profitability. So we expect higher profitability in the summer. And if we look forward to 2022, well, the, the story is quite similar actually to 2021. Uh, the expectations right now are a little bit below 2021, but you can see that in Ontario and Quebec, it very much compares to what we had in 2021. In Manitoba, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, it, we see a, a bigger drop in actually in that ratio. Uh, that's in part because of feed costs in Manitoba and the prairies uh, have gone up with the, the drought. Uh, so this will impact uh, profitability of hog operations in Manitoba. Uh, it, there's other costs, of course, in uh, hog operations. Uh, they could increase as well, uh, if we think especially of cost of supplements and additives and labor costs. Uh, labor uh, access, getting a good labor is becoming more and more an issue, and we expect those uh, will increase in 2022. Okay, so what else should we keep an eye on in the hog sector going forward, Sebastian? Is African swine fever still a concern, and is the Chinese market still demanding North American hogs? Well, uh, ASF, so African swine fever, is pretty much under control in China. Uh, there are still outbreaks here and there, but it's not like a big issue like it was in 2020. Uh, hog production has, be, has come back uh, to a level similar to what it was before the ASF outbreak. Uh, but uh, what has happened, the hog prices in China were super high. So hog producers actually started building the, the herd and so on, producing a lot of hog and producing very heavy hogs. Uh, that meant a huge supply of hogs came on the market and then prices crashed in China. So pr hog prices, pork prices in China are down right now. So it's not a market that it, that's importing like it was it was in, uh, like what it was in 2020 or even in early 2021. So for 2022, we cannot really count on China to support uh, hog prices uh, and pork prices uh, through imports. Um, total, uh, and in fact, uh, even in 2021, uh, that was no longer the case that China was supporting the export market so much. Total, total Canadian pork exports were down in 2021. Uh, and they, especially those to China, they were cut by half. Uh, but Canada was able to export actually more to the United States, to Mexico and the Philippines. Um, it, be, it will be interesting to see what happens with ASF in uh, Thailand. Uh, it, it was discovered recently. It's a small market, but still it, it could have some impact. Uh, Quebec is still dealing with a backlog of, uh, of hog, market-ready hogs right now. Uh, that has built up over a long period of time because of what's, uh, what happened with the pandemic. Uh, there was Omicron also lately, the holidays, and there was a strike also last year. Uh, at a plant in Quebec. So the total backlog right now is approaching 200,000 hogs. So that's pretty large. That will take quite some time to go through that. Uh, it's labor shortages are still a problem. It's both true at the farm and in, uh, in, in at Packers. Uh, labor shortages will be uh, an issue in 2022. Uh, it, that will have to follow pretty closely. Um, we export pork demand to stay strong. Uh, the economy has recovered much of what it has lost during the pandemic. Uh, it, we, we're dealing with the Omicron uh, wave right now, uh, but we expect resp restaurants to reopen soon. And it bodes well actually for the demand for pork. Uh, it, it remains to be seen what kind of damages we'll have because of the uh, Omicron uh, wave. Well, thanks, Sebastian, uh, and for sure it, it would be great news um, to, you know, start seeing some progress in reducing that backlog of hogs in central Canada. Uh, we're going to turn it over now to the cattle industry, and uh, this sector has also faced significant disruptions in processing, and there were backlogs as well in 2021. And we'll turn it back to Craig for your insights on the cattle industry. So Craig, what does the situation, the situation, pardon me, look like for the cattle sector? Yeah, you know, beef processing has returned to pre-pandemic levels. So I think that's a good, good news story right off the bat. You know, cattle slaughter is 7% higher than it was last year and, and slightly higher than it was um, 
uh, than it was in 2019. So, you know, that's a good news story overall. Consumption of beef remains really strong despite significantly higher prices. You know, if we look at the most recent trade data, the value of beef exports are more than 30% higher than it was in 2020 and on pace to double uh, the, the export levels of 2016. Uh, domestically, we're seeing increasing demand at restaurants as Canadian, uh, the Canadian economy reopens. Uh, if we look at total expenditures at restaurants, it's increased 15% um, from 2020 levels. Fast food spending is up nearly 16% from uh, 2020 levels and recovered to pre-pandemic levels in the fast food industry. So when we think about that demand for beef and the, and the importance of the restaurant sector, um, you know, that's a good news story in terms of Canadians wanting to, to purchase uh, uh, more beef again. Demand at grocery store has softened somewhat. Uh, total sales of beef has declined about 4% versus 2020 levels as higher prices um, ha has offset uh, lower demand. So, um, you know, overall, we're down about 15% here on volumes, um, you know, from where we were before. So, you know, that overall picture is, is not surprising. Higher prices at the grocery store is looking at a little bit softer demand, but the, the net position there is, is softening store sales uh, for, for Canadians, uh, producers, and, and the industry. Um, we expect that demand for beef to be strong in 2022, though. With the global uh, economies reopening, consumers have become more price sensitive to food purchases in 2022. Um, and, and we will see expenditure shifts to other parts of the economy uh, and savings are depleted. So, you know, we are going to see some things that are, are softening characteristics, but overall, we expect demand for beef to remain strong in 2022. Good. Now, Sebastian highlighted uh, the high feed costs um, and the impact on hog to corn ratios. So what are you seeing, Craig, for the cattle sector? Yeah, at, you know, at the farm level, I think feeding costs are going to be the number one concern for producers. If we look at the figure here, we can compare uh, cattle to barley and cattle to for, uh, corn feeding ratios. And we noticed that they've uh, declined uh, since the er uh, have been declining since early to mid 2020s and that's primarily due to these higher feed costs. Uh, we are now seeing you know strengthening the ratio in, in eastern Canada cattle prices have strengthened slightly and corn prices have, sorry corn prices have softened somewhat uh, and this is resulting into a bit of a feeding advantage happening in eastern Canada uh, and 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 we're also seeing that that same kind of uh, shift happen uh, towards the United States uh, compared to Western Canada, just because the drought situation, high barley costs, uh, high corn costs uh, to get it into Western Canada as well. Um, consequently, uh, we've seen a significant increase in corn imports from the U.S. Uh, due to that high barley price um, in 2021. And this trend will likely continue into 2022 as barley stocks are likely to remain historically low and don't, don't see a major change on that until new crop starts coming in. And if we have a good crop, that'll help ease some of those uh, pressures. The other story that we did see is cattle inventories did decline due to the drought in, in the Prairie Provinces. Uh, and we expect this trend to continue somewhat, um, you know, just in terms of what is the availability of feed. In the second half of 2021, uh, cattle on feed numbers pointed to an increase in the number of cattle being fed in the Prairie Provinces as poor pasture conditions uh, and reduced feed supplies did force some producers to sell uh, uh, their cows or cows a little earlier than they would typically. Um, you know, drought uh, recovery and feed uh, pasture expectations will be extremely important to monitor moving forward. Uh, do we have sufficient snow and spring rains for pastures to bounce back uh, and water supplies to increase? Because those are some of the major questions and challenges that we ended last year with and, and something that uh, we look to see some improvements overall. So if this does occur, we could see further, uh, if this does not occur, sorry, uh, this could uh, result in further declines to the cattle herd. Uh, conversely, if we see good runoff and we see um, good water supplies here in timely rains, we could see um, the cattle herd holding or maybe increasing into 2022, uh, depending on how that moisture conditions pans out. Okay, sounds like some, some good news. So we recently read in the headlines, Craig, that um, China, South Korea and the Philippines have restricted imports of Canadian beef due to an atypical case of BSE. So do you have any indication of when the markets could reopen and the impacts that these re restrictions are having on the sector? Well, I mean, good news, the Korea uh, borders have opened and, and will resume trade. So that's, uh, you know, really good and timely. 
Um, you know, if we look at these markets, historically, China, South Korea are the number three and number four export markets for Canadian beef. So any restrictions are a concern to the sector. You know, I don't have any real good indication of timing when we could see uh, China, uh, the Philippine markets reopen. Um, the hope is that the issue is cleared up relatively quickly and trade will return to normal um, as soon as possible as uh, the situation continues to evolve. Great. Well, thank you, Craig. And I'm glad to see that uh, the demand for red meat remains robust, despite the uncertain times we've been going through. So let's turn our attention now to the dairy sector and ask Sebastian to share his expectations for dairy in 2022. Sebastian, what do you expect with regards to growth in the dairy industry for the upcoming year? Yeah, uh, there'll be two important factors uh, regarding production growth in uh, 2022. Uh, the first will be domestic demand. Um, if we look back at 2021, the expectations were that the demand for dairy products was going to grow. Uh, and for that reason, the P5, so that's a, a group of marketing boards for the Eastern provinces, uh, it increased its production quota in April and June and uh, announced a series of incentive days uh, for the fall month. Uh, however, uh, that demand actually didn't pan out. Uh, the P5 canceled fall, uh, the fall incentive days and announced uh, uh, for December a 1% code of cut uh, that actually became uh, effective on December 1st. Um, what happened is uh, partly is that the removal of the sanitary measure actually did not cause the demand to increase, but actually to decline, especially for uh, fluid milk. Uh, the situation was similar in the Western provinces, but it wasn't uh, as strong and as, uh, an effect as in the Eastern provinces. Uh, the second factor uh, that will uh, affect uh, uh, the, the production growth in 2022, and that also affected the decision to cut the quota for the P5, is the increase in imports from the United States. Um, under COSMA, so the Canada-US-Mexico uh, uh, trade agreement that became effective in 2020, in July 2020, uh, there are increased import quotas for uh, dairy products. So these are now uh, becoming real. So uh, we're getting, uh, the United States is getting to export more uh, dairy products into Canada. Uh, if we look at the figure now, uh, you'll see actually that uh, imports of dairy products, uh, here what we have is actually cheese, uh, started picking up in 2021. So the dark lines in here, the dark gray lines, uh, columns, or uh, 2021 numbers, you got in green the 2020 and in sort of that blue gray uh, 2019. So you can see that the 20, uh, 2021 bars stand way above those for the previous two years, except for September and October. But then in, in November, actually imports values started picking up. Uh, in terms of volume, it was a 19% increase. If we just look at the first uh, 11 months, uh, in terms of value, though, it's a little bit smaller at 10%. So that's still uh, quite an important increase in imports of, uh, their, uh, of cheese. Uh, uh, JP mentioned uh, earlier that the, uh, we forecast the Canadian dollar value to increase in 2022. So that will favor higher volumes of imports. Uh, of course, if that does not pan out and the Canadian dollar loses from value, uh, it would actually favor less volumes uh, of imports. Um, what we'll follow also is the recent ruling, the impact of the recent ruling and the dis dispute between Canada and the United States over the allocation of import licenses for dairy products. Um, Canada is supposed to, to, become, uh, to come uh, forward with a new uh, allocation method uh, in early February. We don't know what the impact of that will be on imports, uh, but that's something that we'll have to follow uh, in 2022. And what about um, prices and profitability? Can we expect them to improve in the dairy sector in 2022? Well, uh, just like we had, we had in, in hogs and in cattle, uh, higher costs actually are impacting negatively uh, profitability. Uh, and for that reason, the Kenyan Dairy Commission announced uh, uh, in early fall actually that it would increase starting February 1st uh, the support price for uh, butter by 12.4%, uh, 12, uh, 12 
And the, as a result of that, uh, it's expected actually that the farm gate price will increase by about 8.4%. Uh, um, but you know, the farm gate price does not depend only on butter fat. It depends also on other components of milk. And what we've seen over the last few months is actually that the price of uh, non-fat uh, solids has been increasing. So that means uh, that we're likely to see an increase in farm gate price of less than 8.4%, but still it's because other prices have been increasing. Uh, so it's, it's actually uh, a good news for uh, dairy producers. Uh, and on, on that, uh, mentioning the, the price of, for non-dairy uh, solid non-fat, uh, their prices have increased by 40% uh, compared to a year ago. So it, it's one component of milk where we see actually prices increasing. Um, these higher price uh, for farm gate uh, milk prices will be actually counterbalancing counter part of the product increase in production costs, but not uh, entirely. Uh, and given that the farm uh, gate price will increase, we'll have also uh, an increase in the price at retail. And it would be interesting to see whether actually dairy pools uh, will be able to increase production in 2022, given how much uh, dairy farm price uh, will be increasing. Uh, the figure we'll have on the screen uh, shows actually inflation for selected products. Uh, the four on the left, the four bars on the left are for dairy products. So we have dairy products in general, cheese, butter, and fresh milk. Then we have food and all items. So uh, all items is general inflation. And as uh, Darlene mentioned at the outset, a rate of inflation at 4.8%. And then we, we have other uh, animal products, uh, substitutes for milk, such as fish, eggs, uh, poultry, pork, and beef. And what we can see is actually that inflation on dairy products and that the period covered here by the data, the data is between December 2020 and December 2021. Uh, inflation for the dairy products in general has been lower than other products just in general or substitute products. So that suggests even though that farm gate prices will increase, which would result, result in increase in uh, retail prices, that there's some room actually to absorb uh, those uh, uh, increases without impacting uh, consumptions too much. Uh, the question is, will, still, will we have some growth in demand uh, and consumption or in 2022? Well, that remains to be known because we're a little bit in uncharted territory with such a large price increase uh, at the farm gate. Uh, and we must consider also what's going on with the imports as well. Uh, so uh, whether uh, it would be possible to increase production in 2022 uh, remains to be seen, uh, but uh, there certainly would be a bit more difficult than in previous years. Well, thanks, Sebastian. That's a great overview. And, um, you know, we've reviewed, a, uh, we've reviewed a few key sectors now in terms of size, but there are a lot of other sectors that we've not yet covered. So, in fact, I'd argue that the diversity of the Canadian farm economy is probably one of its major strengths. So I'll turn it back to you now, JP, to try in, in a matter of a few minutes to discuss some of those other sectors. And let's start uh, right away with the potato sector. So JP, what is the one economic factor that's worth monitoring in 2022 for this sector? Oh, JP, you're on mute. I know, yeah. I did it as well. Rapid fire <laughs> economic chat, there we go. So potatoes, obviously the ban of PEIX, fresh, fresh potato exports to the US is, is going to be a challenge this year. Uh, it's about $125 million worth of revenues. And so we're going to have to find a market for these potatoes. But if you look at, you know, the U.S. being such a, a, a large market and, and relevant market for us, if you look at their own production in the last couple of years, it's, it was actually a bit disappointing, right? So we had uh, production down, you know, roughly 10% last year, I believe, for potato production in the U.S. So I think supply is getting tighter. And so, and then I don't see any reason why demand with the economy reopening both in the US and in Canada and so forth, I just don't see demand slowing down. So as I said, um, I think some challenges in the Eastern part of the country to, 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 to find some markets for the potatoes that we're not gonna be able to ship out. And, and that may actually, you know, put some emphasis or downward pressure on prices that producers get. But overall, I do think that the outlook for the potato sector remains positive due to 
this uh, little bit of an imbalance between you know supply and or available supply and demand. Okay, now let's talk uh, chicken industry. So I know food service restrictions and the resulting shift in consumption patterns have been challenging for the broiler industry. So what do you think profitability for this sector will look like in 2022? Yeah, so very good question. I, I do think that like any other livestock sector, if you think of the broiler sector, obviously feed costs are an issue. Um, in the broiler sector, we have a, a feed uh, adjustment component to pricing that sort of offsets some of the upside risk when it comes to higher feed costs. So I think that's a good thing, but there's always lag when, when those adjustments are made. So that's the one thing to, to consider. So, but given that's um, not as much of a concern, I would say, than, than in red meat, I would focus on demand. And so up on the screen, you'll see in a second that we computed what we call an index of demand for chicken. And we also have beef up on the screen. And this is, I want to point out, this is not consumption, right? So this is, it measures the, the, the willingness of consumers to buy chicken products at the retail level, given chicken prices, given the prices of competing products like beef and pork, given the disposable income of consumers, given the availability of products. So it captures all of this, right? And so if we account for all of these things that matter in explaining consumption, then we come up with this index of demand. And it was trending up both for chicken and, and beef actually prior to the pandemic. Uh, chicken demand actually was down at the, in the early days of the pandemic, but since the last two quarters of data that we have in 2021, it goes all the way up to the end of the third quarter, uh, in, um, so the end of September of last year, we're seeing demand now resuming its growth. And so I expect that once we get the data for the remainder or the remaining three months of 2021 and the early uh, part of 2022, I fully expect this to trend up again. And I do think that, again, you know, tied to the reopening of the economy and just a word on beef as well. I mean, beef consumption was up from between 2015 and 2020. Uh, so beef consumption has been trending upward and it was trending upward up to the pandemic in the early days of the pandemic. The reason why we're seeing a little bit of a decline now is that, you know, we had some strong export performance. And so if you look at our beef export numbers, they're up in 2021. And that explains a little bit of the, uh, availability of product, a tight availability of product here domestically. But I would fully expect that once we're returning to this uh, more towards a normal outlook for food consumption uh, purchasing patterns, I do think that beef and both beef and, and poultry are going to go up. Okay, now let's shift it over to the greenhouse industry. So greenhouse vegetable receipts uh, for the first three quarters of 2021 um, uh, have been on the rise. So that's good news. So what, would, what can we expect for this sector moving forward? Well, you mentioned it. It's, it. Revenues have been going up, and that's mostly on the back of strong prices. So this is a very diverse, you talked about diversity in, in the introduction. I, this is also a very diverse sector itself. I mean, a lot of different products that are grown uh, by greenhouse operators. And so, but overall, I would say that prices in 2021 last year were above the five-year average for a lot of the different products not all of them but most of them so so good news on the on the revenue side of things i think you know when it comes to greenhouse production i would look at the cost side of the equation when you think of profit right so we have you know this overall inflation trend that we've discussed a lot today i do think it has a major impact when it comes to greenhouse production if you look at cardboard um if if you know lots of different material like plastic pots and so forth i mean all of that has gone up on top of natural gas prices that have been up uh, in 2021. They're down now, you know, since if you look at where they are now versus where they were at the peak in 2021. But nonetheless, I do think that they're higher than their average. And I do think it, it sort of um, challenges profitability. Now, good news from an export standpoint, I think if you look at the entire energy situation in North America, we're, you know, in a much better spot than in Europe, for example. So maybe it opens up some export opportunities. But overall, I do think that it, it, uh, the number one challenge right now is looking at the cost side of, of production for greenhouses. Okay, and how about small fruit? So this is a very diverse sector in itself. So if we focus maybe on blueberries, what are the most relevant trends that you see for uh, blueberries in 2022, JP? Yeah, small fruits, another very diverse sector. If you think of blueberries, I think the one thing, I always go back to, supply and demand, right? A good old, you know, analysis of supply and demand factors, I think reveals a lot about pricing trends. And if you think of blueberry, I do think that you need to 
think of the local market versus the global market. So globally, uh, we've had lots of different challenges, again, you know, discussed today with regards to supply chains, transportation, and so forth. And so um, for blueberries, I do think that it has had some of the supply chain disruptions globally have had an impact on exports of large producers. You could think of Chile, for example, exports are down in 21 by 7%, I believe. So overall, I think, you know, some of the challenges when it comes to shipping and supply uh, globally that I do think are kind of a, a good um, supportive of prices for 2022. Having said that, we ended the year in December at prices roughly a little bit lower than the five-year average. So this is a bit of a question mark when it comes to available supply globally and the trend that we're expecting for 2022. The one thing though that I'd like to emphasize that is a real positive is that despite all the disruptions when it comes to food consumption patterns and habits because of the pandemic, freshness and, and health are two key drivers of food purchasing decisions locally. And so from that standpoint, I do think that I don't see any reason why demand would slow down. I do think that demand is going to keep going up and maybe even some of the disruptions that we've seen, um, I think are just going to, we're going to be able to put them behind us in 2022. And so I'm fairly optimistic that demand is going to be a very positive trend for the blueberry industry. Great. So that puts an end, JP, to our um, rapid economic updates on those uh, few other sectors. So I want to thank you and thank all of the economic team for those very relevant indicators uh, for 2022, the upcoming year. So we're going to transition now to the next part of this event, which will focus on the so what behind the trends and expectations that we identified up to now. So the one overall common theme that stands out for me is the topic of uncertainty. So we all have gotten some really good insights on what we should be monitoring, but what should a farm business operator do with all of this? Um, and to talk about this, I'll now turn it over to Andrea de Groot, who is a business advisor here at FCC. Hello, Andrea. Hi, thanks, Darlene. Well, that was a lot of information in a really short period of time. And the topics that JP, Sebastian and Craig really addressed today have highlighted all the, the variables that can impact business, but they've also um, un uncovered a few of the unknowns that we just can't uh, foresee right now. And with that sheer volume of information and some of those unknowns, I think we, we can see that it would be leaving people overwhelmed and maybe even unsure about what next to do. Um, so I'm here today to hopefully help you address what the next steps would be from this meeting and to help you unpack that sheer volume of information. As a, as a member of the FCC Advisory Services team, I work with Canadian farmers and we help break down the large topics into some smaller bite-sized pieces. And from there, encourage people to make some action plans about what you're going to do. And typically when I'm working with Canadian farmers, it's specific to their transition plans. And those uh, transition plans really include some highly emotional conversations and some very complex scenarios. When you combine those with the challenges that were outlined today in the day-to-day -day business, figuring out how you can make some positive steps for your business can be really overwhelming. And so from what the FCC economics team have done, they've really highlighted some fantastic insights. Um, they've reviewed the 2021 uh, year. And as we're getting excited to look into the 2022, the question is, what are you gonna do with all that information that they presented? And so my hope today is to help simplify some steps that you can take the information that was presented and then break them down from these complicated big world issues and put some next steps into for specifically for your farm. And for today, one of the small steps that I want you to encourage about is to take some time to evaluate how you can um, evaluate this information and then focus on a few of the key topics rather than the sheer volume of all of them. Let's talk about what's going on in your farm and which of these key concerns relate back to your farm. So the questions that are on the screen right now um, are regards to how does this information come back to your farm? What aspects of this issue can you control? And who else can you lean on to to get some additional um, help to manage this challenge? 
as well, there is some um, opportunity. So what kind of opportunities can be created for your farm from this information? Um, and here's one step. How can you communicate what was discussed today or what you learned and take that back to your farm operation? A key skill in family business is communication. And in my current role as business advisor, I really do see the need for improved communication and the ability to talk through big topics and then be able to bring them back and relate them to your farm business. So if we're going to communicate what you learned today, let's start with who would you actually talk about this information with? And before we dive a little bit deeper into that topic, I also want to take a moment to stress that I really encourage you to take the time to discuss the topics uh, that were presented today with others, rather than keeping these topics in your own mind and stressing about them in silence. Um, it's really helpful when you have concerns of this magnitude to, to speak with others and to understand that you are not alone in dealing with these kinds of issues. So here's some, here's some steps that you can uh, consider when you're gonna be communicating with your other family or business partners. The first one is consider who needs to be at the table. So are there key people who would have insights or information or there, are there other key people who may be impacted by the decisions from this information? Schedule a time uh, for a meeting that works for everyone. Let's ensure that uh, the people that are coming to this meeting or having this conversation, make it a priority, create an agenda, have somebody um, who's a note taker actually record the information as you're discussing it within the, the meeting and set some clear action points. And what I mean by that is set out some timelines, maybe some responsibilities, follow up from this meeting or from the communication that you're going to be talking through. And in order to help support some additional communication at the farm level, we will be sharing a resource after this event called Talking the Talk. And this resource highlights the best practices and and some helpful tips on how to improve communication within your farm business. So we're gonna talk through an example from today and that's inflation. Uh, we, we heard this conversation around inflation in almost every one of the commodity sectors. And so if we're going to take some time to dive a little bit deeper into the topic of inflation, one of the questions to consider is who's gonna be included in that conversation? So. Is it going to be only a business owner conversation? Are you going to extend that out to, to family members or even managers of an operation? Or will you reach out to some suppliers and other technical advisors to really help you address the concerns of inflation specific to your own farm? Um, when you're determining who should be at the table, it's important to recognize that some of the people who could bring additional information in or if they um, are going to be impacted by the decisions. The people at these meetings will vary from time to time based on the information and the decisions that you're going to be discussing at that time. Now, in regards to inflation specifically, I want to address that certain family members may have experienced this in the past. And so they may have some emotional um, triggers and an emotional response to this topic. While we may have other people at the table, maybe from a different generation, who are unfamiliar with this topic, they don't have the experience, and so they may be uncertain why we're even having a conversation about this at all. So before we sit down at a desk or at a table to have a conversation on a topic like inflation, let's take a moment to acknowledge and to give everyone access to the information in the topic before we sit down. And that way they can process the information in their own time and then come prepared and ready to have a conversation. As members of family or business, it's also important to acknowledge that everyone will process information differently. Some people need a quiet time to reflect on the information before they're able to actually discuss it, while others actually need to discuss it and talk it out in order to understand the information better. Key question that I like to ask is, do all of the parties or everybody at the meeting, do they have the same access to the same information? And if not, let's take some time to level set that access to the information. Another key question is to reach out to your industry people, uh, to technical partners, and understand if they can bring additional support, maybe some additional data to this conversation so that it can help you put the pieces of this puzzle together. 
And as we sit down and we're ready to have these conversations, one of the most critical aspects of having um, a good conversation is allowing the appropriate amount of time to be able to discuss it. Uh, most farm families have the opportunity to speak with one another on a regular basis throughout the day. However, if you wanna have a targeted conversation on a specific topic, I do not recommend having that conversation while people are busy. Trying to multitask during a conversation like this can lead to frustration and confusion. And it may leave people feeling unprepared for that conversation or just annoyed that you interrupted whatever task they were doing. So if that's the case, people won't be able to process the information that we're trying to discuss and because we won't have their full attention. So this is why it's really crucial to set um, to set the time and to be able to be focused on whatever conversation that you're having. Oops, sorry, I just skipped ahead there. Um, and one of the other things that we had earlier discussed was an agenda. And uh, having an agenda allows the time for each of the conversation points to be heard. And that means that everyone will understand what is being discussed. And ideally, each of the members of the group or this conversation will come with their own set of questions and have time to ask um, each of the questions. The other thing that having an agenda and giving everyone access to the conversation is this will allow or ensure that one person doesn't dominate the whole conversation. When you have people with different kinds of experiences and exposures, especially knowledge, and I'm gonna go back to our example of inflation, we wanna make sure that everyone has space to ask their questions and to be able to digest that information. And if one person dominates that conversation, you're not gonna get as, as much of, out of that information as we would like. So taking some time to really create that level playing field for everybody can um, help everyone understand why it's a concern and then give them time to ask their questions. So now that we've um, identified what we're gonna be talking about, we have the right people at the table, we've set a time to meet, the next step is to really get into the nuts and bolts of whatever topic that you want to discuss. And as I already alluded to, we're going to, our conversation here would be on inflation. And so what kind of key questions that are going to re directly relate back to your farm are you going to ask? And there's some questions out here on the, uh, on the screen in terms of what exactly is inflation? What is, how is that inflation calculated? Think back to our presentation today and there was a lot of information and a lot of insights because in this specific conversation, it's a financial conversation. And I would encourage you to take some time to make sure that everyone at the table, again, understands the terms that are being discussed, because if they get caught on a specific financial term, they're not going to understand the importance of this particular section. And being able to ask open-ended questions like the ones that are on the screen are really going to be able to help guide that conversation and that's gonna be able to identify if there's gaps in knowledge or differences in opinion. And if that conversation digresses, use the agenda to come back to that original question or come back to that original concern, and then make sure everyone has a clear understanding before you proceed to that next question. And think back to today's review. They shared lots of insights, and so there's lots of good information that you can um, understand and take back to that farm. So, What's next? From this point, it's really important to understand um, how the information presented comes back to your specific farm. And what I would do is encourage you to adjust or create a business plan. And from that business plan, then take some time to identify the concerns and then link that back to your cash flow. And understanding how your, your business plan and that cash flow work this will help support some better decision making and give you some better confidence and some more increased confidence in going into this next year. So how can FCC help you? Well, our next webinar is focused on building a better business plan. So taking some time to review and modify that business plan during times of volatility, as we outlined already today, will help create some confidence. And Dr. Van Mossau from the University of Guelph will be helping in that next webinar to bring some focus and put some process around building those business plans. And here's a challenge for you. I would like you to think back to the presentation today and think of your farm and pick a topic. Then I'd like you to take some time to review who's gonna be at that table, 
set, set a meeting, set the agenda, but most importantly, I want you to take the time, time to discuss with your family, your farm partners, or your peers. And then after you've had that conversation, you'll be better prepared to come back to that next webinar on business planning and apply the knowledge that you learned from having those kinds of conversations and put some of that context from big world issues back into specifically into your own farm business plan. And another way that FCC can help is if you were to reach out to meet with myself or one of my team members and within the FCC advisory uh, services team, we're here to help within the pre-transition planning. And within that, Successful tra transition planning really starts with solid business planning. So helping to discuss where you are in your farm and where you wanna go can also help support that business planning strategies. So oops. <laughs> whether we're discussing, um, so whether we're discussing business plans, transition plans, or just learning, the next step is really on you because those are all processes that take time. And I encourage you to take the time um, to move through all of those processes and really encourage you to take the time to understand how these issues are going to come back to your farm specifically. So one step at a time, you will get this done and you will get closer to your goals. And the next step is on you. Please take the time. Thanks, Darlene. Well, thank you, Andrea, for those great pieces of advice and suggestions on how to take some of the topics that we heard here today and actually bring them back to the farm operations uh, so, and to see what we can manage or what can be controlled on the farm. Um, that brings us, everybody, to uh, the end of the 2022 FCC Ag Economic Outlook, and we hope that you enjoyed this event today. As mentioned earlier, uh, a recording will be made available to all of those that were registered. So if you missed uh, any piece of information, you can always go back and watch it again. I encourage you also to keep checking back on the FCC website. You can go to the Knowledge tab and then click on Economics to access any new economic information. Today, for example, we have published a detailed outlook report for grains and oil seeds, which you will find in there and other sector reports will follow uh, through the months of January and February. So with that, everybody, thank you once again for watching. And from all of us here at FCC, we wish you a happy and a wonderful new year.